you just want peace. You imagine a day and you daydream about a time where you come home at the end of the day and there's nothing going on. That would be a miracle, right? Not to have something crazy happening, somebody over-medicating, what's worrying about, are we going to get through dinner? Is so-and-so even going to come home? How are they going to come home tonight? And maybe you're remembering back to a time where you had that peace in your family, where things seemed normal for once. Or maybe you've never had that feeling of normal. And like me, I know because I grew up in in a crazy environment thinking to myself, what would it be like to have a normal family where I would come home at the end of the day? I mean, I could could envision it as a little girl thinking, man, that'd be so, I thought it was such a weird idea to have a functioning family sit around a table and actually talk about the day. Hey, John, how was your day today? Well, it was great. How about you, Susie? What'd you learn? And I thought, well, that's that's not real because in my house, people were slinging stuff across the table or going for the throat or somebody was having an outburst or somebody was falling off a chair. I mean, it was never a normal event. And if we made it through dinner, God, heaven forbid, you know, there was something happening, then it was like, well, at the end of the night, you know, things started to like unravel as the time went on. So maybe you're like me, you know, maybe you, you either grew up in a dysfunctional, addicted, crazy house, or you married into it. And you thought, how the hell did that happen? I didn't grow up in a situation like this. This is my first rodeo. So listen, whether it's your first rodeo, or it feels like you've been in this rodeo for your entire life, I've got you covered today because I'm going to talk to you about how to have peace, how to make peace with another's addiction. Now, I'm not saying how to make it notice. I'm not teaching how to make it disappear, how to make it go away, how to fix it. I know that you've been trying that and for to, to no avail. We're going to talk about all the things you've been doing to try to fix this. Uh, but we're, we're more going to go in the lines of what would it take for you to make peace? You know, when you think about a willow tree, I love trees. I'm obsessed with trees. And a willow tree is one of my favorite trees and I love it so much because of it, it, it is strong and beautiful and graceful all in one. There's not many things that are like that, right? But I find that the willow tree is, meaning it's so strong. You can see these huge roots that go down into the ground far and will cut through anything. And it can move through concrete, a willow tree, you know, just so rooted. Yet, even in the, the, the worst of storms, The willow tree is able to dance with the rain and maintain its grace and flexibility and not get destroyed by what's happening around it. In fact, after the storm, the willow tree is just as beautiful as, you know, or just intact as before the storm came. And that's really what I want for you and I. Not that we're going to magically fix this thing, because that's what we've been holding on to forever. But that no matter what happens around us, no matter how crazy somebody gets in your presence or how they attempt to knock you off your axis or make you feel a million different things that you don't want to feel, guilt, shame, manipulated, exhausted, overwhelmed, anxious, that you know how to stay in your lane and stay in control of yourself and make peace no matter what's going on around you. Would that be worth it for you if you could learn how to do that? I think so. I know it's certainly changed my life growing up in a world of chaos to learn how to be like, I think about, you know, when Yoda goes up on a mountain and he teaches people how to sit there and no matter what's going around, he's in that zone, he's in the flow state and he's making stuff happen in his own life, no matter what's going on around him. In fact, in one of the episodes of Star Wars, maybe you're not a Star Wars person, I just am because of the concept of Yoda. I just believe in self-mastery, right? But what, what, what they're teaching there is no matter what's going on around you, you can, you can, you can maintain yourself. And that is the art of boundaries. That is the art of self um, mastery. And that's the path that I want to take with you. And that I take with my students and clients who go along with me for this ride even deeper. Now, by the way, if you're new here, I do want to take a minute and say, welcome home. I'm Heidi Rain. It is so nice to meet you. I am so glad you found me. It is divine appointment. It's not by accident. This is a big place, podcasts, YouTube. It's a miracle that you're here. Now, I hope that when you're here, I'm going to give you something that you need to hear today a perspective you need to shift into, an awareness you need to come into, a thought you need to let go of, an idea you need to grab a hold of, something that when you leave this conversation today, you are a better person than when you sat down for it. And a better person meaning you're better off. All right, I wanna equip you. Now, if you wanna go further at any time, 
I have lots of different opportunities to work with you privately or in a group setting or through a course or a program. So many choices. Go over to HeidiRain.com and see which kind of road would suit you best. Everyone right now is really in love with this 90 minute strategic session that I'm offering where I sit with you, you dump out all the things. You tell me everything that is going on in your situation. And then I give you a strategy, a step-by-step, my insight, uh, exactly what I feel like you need to do or or what would be most helpful in the situation to, to get your life back. And I know these things because I've dedicated my whole life to it. That's my course of study. It's also my my wisdom I've gained through decades of experience working with thousands of clients and specializing in addiction and codependency. So you're in very good hands. And now today, let's dive into how you can start to cultivate peace. So what is peace? Peace is the absence of war. All right. So what does that mean? Well, if I'm at peace, I'm not at war. I'm ending the fight. I'm out of battle. And that battle can be with another person. That battle can be with a thing. That battle can be with a place. That battle can be with an idea. That battle can be with a limitation you have. There are many ways that we battle, but it's always the battlefield of where? The mind, right? Where I'm at war with a thing where I think it's outside of me, right? I'm at war with somebody else, but it all roads lead back to Rome. And real peace isn't the end of conflict with other people. Because conflicts with other people are going to come and go all the time. You're, you're, you know, like John Maxwell has has taught me and many other people, all motion causes friction. So when you're moving in the world, you're going to piss and upset people off. Okay. There's going to be friction and conflict. But the true peace isn't the wishful thinking that all conflict is going to end with other people. True peace is the end of conflict within yourself. So first thing we need to do if we're going to restore peace is to figure out Where are you in conflict with yourself? Well, you know that I specialize in addiction and codependency, but I'm gonna take it a step further. I hone in on people that are in intimate relationships with addicts or alcoholics. Now, you don't have to be in an intimate relationship, but what I discovered is there is a big gap in the world. Like parents can get help, addicts and alcoholics can get help, and there's two populations that that are lost in the dust. One is the spouses of addicts and alcoholics, and the other one is kids that grew up in that dynamic. And I serve those two under underserved populations. So when I come with you today with this advice, I am coming from the advice perspective of you're a partner, you're a spouse, you're a lover, you're you're in an intimate dynamic. But this advice does apply if you happen to be a parent as well, or if you happen to have a parent. So everybody can benefit, but I'm really talking to the spouses today. So here are some ways that you uniquely continue to be in battle. The three ways that you live in the battlefield of addiction and how you can restore your peace and end the conflict within these three key areas. Maybe you've heard some of these things before. If you've been to Al-Anon, you probably have. You've probably heard of the three C's, cause, control, and cure. I think that's cause, control, and cure. I'm pretty sure it is. That's what we're going to talk about today. Uh, But you think that, you know, uh, you've heard that before when people say, oh, yeah, you can't cause it. You you can't cure it. You know, you can't control it. And, but then they don't, they don't say, well, how specifically to stop doing those things, right? It's a really good slogan. It's like, let go and let God. That's a really beautiful thing to say. What the does it mean at the end? How do you do that, right? If there were, so it's, oh, yes, of course. You just, you can't call, you didn't cause it. You can't cure it. You don't control it. Let go and let God, you know? And I mean, nobody's thinking about all the people that have religious trauma or spiritual deficiency where they're like, well, let's see how that turns out. God's not there. It hasn't been there for me. You know, they have that discrepancy and, and, or they just don't know how the heck to do that. What does that mean? Because even people that are letting go and letting God, I promise you are praying incessantly for the same thing. They're not letting it go of the outcome. They're still attached to the outcome and they're talking to God and they're saying things like, God, turn it around, turn the lights on, make them get it, help them understand it. There, there is no letting go and letting God. It's like, I'm going to like, like, obsess with God to get this thing done. And that's still a form of control. That's still a form of being able, unable to let go. So let's, the difference between me and Al-Anon for today's purposes, Al-Anon is a great thing. Okay. I'm not saying it's not, I have had many clients that have got tremendous support by going to Al-Anon and talking and listening to other people's stories, but there's a whole nother group of people that do not vibe with Al-Anon. 
They don't want to hear the other stories. It feels like it's a miserable place for them. And that's real. They go in there, they feel worse. They're like, is this what my life is? Is this, is this what I might, I might as well just, I don't know what the hell I'm going to do if this is the life I'm going to sign up for. It's depressing to them. It's disparaging to them. And the other element is it's kind of like this radical acceptance place where maybe that's not really what you want to do. You, you, you have a hard time really understanding how to be in this thing or out of this thing. And you don't know which end is up. So the difference between that and me is I, I, <laughs> I give you strategy. I'm going to, it's not like, I'm not, you know, the blind leading the blind, like well, we're in a relationship. We have to let it go. Yes. No, it is strategic advice on exactly how to do the damn thing. Okay. So that's what we're going to talk about. So the first thing you need to be aware of is you didn't cause this. Now I know intellectually, you know that you're like, I know I didn't cause their addiction. They're, they've been doing this for a long time, Heidi. They've been doing this for a long time without me. I know I did not cause this, but surely did their mom did their dad did it runs in the uncle Henry did, you know, you're, you're still placing the blame, whether it's not on yourself, you're projecting it onto another person. This is a war within yourself because you are constantly strategizing and scratching your head and going, who's to blame here? Who's responsible for this? Where can I point my finger at so that I can feel better about what's happening and make sense of all this? And when you do that, you are enabling that person by helping them shirk that responsibility. Here's something you need to know and believe so that you can start to heal from this cause idea of addiction. Before I teach you that, I want you to know one thing. I know intellectually, you know this. Heidi, I know I didn't cause it. This is common sense. Then tell me, love, why do you, when they say I'm drinking because you're not having sex with me, I'm drinking because you're not there for me. I'm drinking because you require so much financial support and I'm overwhelmed. I'm drinking because you care more for the kids than me. I'm drinking. And then when you hear that, you go, I am the cause. The gaslight seeps in. And you and I both know that it's very hard for you to intellectually, you can maintain that boundary intellectually, but emotionally it cuts right into your heart. It seeps and penetrates into your heart and you start believing it. And then you act accordingly. Well, if it's my fault, I better do the dance. I better put on my symbols and do the dance at the circus so that I can, you know, stop causing these problems from happening. If the kids are just quiet enough, if Susie doesn't bother daddy, if I just let mom go upstairs and send her away from the kids, everything's going to be okay. And that's, that is believing that you are responsible somehow for it. So here's what you need to know. Many people still believe addiction is caused by trauma. Right. That is the, so let's find the person to blame. Let's find the root of that. Let's find who that person is. Let's rectify that situation. Let's have them admit something bad happened to them so that we can get at this root and we can be done with these things and wash our hands. But that is, it's not that simple and it's not that direct. It's much more complex. Addiction is a web of lies, deceit, <laughs> coping mechanisms, uh, biology, psychology, sociology. It's, it's, a, it's a web of things. It's not one thing. And trauma by itself doesn't create addiction. Well, you're traumatizing me, so I drink. Or that trauma happened to me, so I drink. There are lots of us in our lives who have experienced immense amounts of trauma. Maybe you have. You probably don't recognize the depths of the trauma that you're experiencing currently, but you are. You're in a relationship with an addict or an alcoholic. You're, you're getting CPTSD. You are getting post-traumatic stress disorder because why you're in war you're in war you're in a war without weapons even worse you're in a war with no weapons and no maps and you don't know what the hell's going on so it's it's bad but what happens is to a lot of people who have trauma the coping mechanism doesn't really become addiction it becomes achievement for some people you'll notice some very successful people in the world have drive and ambition. And really that's like trauma drive. They didn't become addict or alcoholics. They became CEOs. Okay. Still the same stuff underneath. The coping mechanism was different. So trauma in and of itself doesn't create addiction. The coping mechanism to trauma is what creates the addiction. I can cope with trauma by succeeding. I can create cope with trauma by exercising. I can co cope with trauma by going to therapy. I can cope with trauma by drinking alcohol and doing drugs. There's a multitude of ways, but trauma itself doesn't create that. So when somebody's saying to you, it's because my mom abandoned me, it's because my dad, you can look at that person or because you're not having sex with me or because you're, and I use that twice because that's a real thing. 
course you don't want to have sex with an addict or an alcoholic when they're actively alcoholic. That is the last thing you want to do. And then they use that lack of desire in you to be intimate as a weapon against you to blame you for their addiction. It's ridiculous and it's not real. And I'm shining the light on it. So the next time they say that to you, it's your fault in some way, shape or form. You look at them and you say, I understand that you believe that, that, that makes sense of why you would say that. And you're drinking because you're an active alcoholic who's untreated. Not because I didn't have sex with you last Tuesday. All right. You're using drugs because you're an untreated drug addict. Not because, you know, maybe it's all combined, but let's work on getting treatment first. So you've got to let go of the I caused this or Shirley caused this or Jimbo caused this or whoever else or Uncle Rick. Okay. You've got to start to think to yourself, they're drinking or they're using because they are an untreated alcoholic, not because so-and-so made him sad. The road to recovery is long and windy. We're, de- we're unpacking trauma. We're dealing with all of that. We're, but we're not just working on trauma. We're working on coping skills. We're working on stress tolerance. We're working on life fulfillment. Trauma is one tiny piece of this equation. It's not the whole picture. It's like looking at an addicted person and just looking at trauma. And like you're looking at a Renoir through a pinhole. You don't see the whole painting. You don't see the whole picture, Okay. So if you can let that go, how do you start to do that? How do you start to make peace? You start to hear the crazy. You start to recognize the gaslight. When you're with a human being and you're hearing them start to blame you or shame you or guilt you or gaslight you into responsibility for their behavior, you refuse to take it on. I do this a lot with my clients. I don't know where it is now, but I have a little hot potato. I wish it was here. It's somewhere. A literal hot potato that I say, when somebody gives you and blames you, it's like a game of hot potato. You take you you choose to take it and have it burn your hot little hands, you know, and, and sizzle your fingers off, or you give that hot potato right back and say, yes, and, okay, and, yes, and, I get that, and it's still your responsibility to be well, okay? So just notice, where are you accepting responsibility? You know how that feels when we all love a good court thing, and if you're like me, I don't know, I'm, I'm kind of... <laughs> I I hate to admit it sometimes, but I really get obsessed with like dark stuff, like serial killers, their psychology, like the Jeffrey Dahmer thing. I was like, I was eating dinner watching that. I mean, I, and my husband's like, how is this not? I'm like, it's fascinating. He's like, how are you not <laughs> disgusted? I'm like, I don't know. I'm fascinated by this. So you can be, you know, uh, like a fascinating with this kind of thing, but we all have this similar thing where maybe it's not that dark, but it's like, you know, justice, right? The world is obsessed with justice. You can look at all the Marvel movies where it's like the Justice League and know we're a world obsessed with justice. And how do we feel when a person gets off scot-free from something they did and they shirk responsibility? We're uproarious. We have... P- uh, you know, t- picket things. We say, convict them. They're, you know, we want to throw and put them, put them away, you know, because we are a people that really resonates with guilt that is properly placed. We want people to be held accountable and we want people to be responsible. That's an innate uh, thing that we have as a, as a human being. We are fight for justice. But imagine how you feel at a wrongful conviction. Did you ever watch some of those shows where people are in prison for a very long time and they didn't do they didn't do it? Well, you're not in a physical prison, but you are in a mental and emotional prison wrongfully convicted. That's you. You're in a relationship where you're believing that you're responsible for their bad behavior or for their self-destructive behavior or for their addictions or their dysfunction or their narcissism and you are wrongfully convicted hostage. So when you can start to recognize that, you can start to let yourself go. Let's move on to the second thing, which is control. You are in prison. You are at war because you believe you have control over this thing. You really do. And you tell me, no, I don't. Heidi, uh, psychologically, intellectually, no brainer, right? I know I don't have any control. It's obvious to me. If I had control, this thing would be locked up, buttoned down and fixed. But I don't have control. But you, what, let's talk about how you believe you still do and how I know you still believe that you have control. Because as much as you like to think that you don't do these things, you are still doing them. 
You are still checking receipts. You are still looking at bottles to see how much is being drunk. You're still looking through the trash. You're still searching the garage. You're still going through the internet. You're still um, trying to get them to admit to you. You're still seeking truth in the land of lies and asking them, why can't you just be honest with me? Now, by the way, I did a whole video on that or a whole podcast on that. It says, why can't you just tell me the truth? Why addicts lie? You should definitely check that out. It's going to be very helpful for you. Uh, Because there's a science to that and why that's happening. But you still do believe you have control because you dump out the alcohol or you just want them to have this kind of alcohol and not that kind of alcohol. Or you think if you drink with them or use with them just a little bit, you can control how much they're going to consume. You try to call the friends up and tell them about, you know, uh, what to, how to behave and what to do. You, you strategize what restaurant to go to. You have it timed out. You know, if you go at this hour, they're going to be less likely to get annihilated. And if you, you know, you, you do try to control it. And if you're not doing any of those things, you are certainly intervening with your kids. If you have that, where you are not being honest with them about what's going on, you are protecting and covering up. That is another way to try to control this thing. Control the damage, control the fallout, make the kids less less impacted. It's not working. I love you and it's not working. I know your best interest is to protect and shield your kids from the damage, but the damage is being done. And what's happening is you're doubling down on the damage being done when you pretend the damage isn't happening. And what that means is the actor alcoholic is damaging the kids and you covering it up is damaging them as well. So we don't want a double dose. Somebody needs to be awake. Somebody needs to be conscious. Somebody needs to be alert. Somebody needs to shine the light and somebody needs to be the light in a dark place and look at the kids and go, tell me what's happening with you. Are you okay? And when you talk to your kids, they're going to say, I'm fine. I'm fine. I did another video or podcast on that as well about how this does impact the kids. You can see this ministry goes very deep. I try to think about everything that could be going on in your family and find a way to support and intervene so that we can, we can restore peace to you. But also my big goal, I mean, it's no secret, I've said it many times, is to protect the next generation, is to fight for those kids that are growing up in this and don't have a say, you know, and they're impacted. And guess what's going to happen? Most of them are going to be successful in life. They're going to become success. Half of them will become success, half won't. And what'll happen is they'll all, whether they are successful, quote unquote, or not, will have relationship issues. Because being in a relationship with an average alcoholic hits hard in one place. And that area is the area of love and relationships. It doesn't hit the money as hard as it does. doesn't hit anything. Success, it hits love and relationships. And isn't that why we're here at the end of the day? So how do you, how do you restore peace in your mind is you end the conflict. You end the conflict of thinking you have control. You start to notice and become aware of where in your daily life are you believing you have this thing by the, by the balls or the wheel or <laughs> whatever you're doing. Okay. You, you start to look for that. Now, awareness is the first step in all these things. So you look for awareness of where you're buying the gaslight. You cause this or surely cause this or uncle Rick. Then you're looking at the idea that you can control this. And then the last thing is you're looking for the cure. You're looking for the cure, meaning they go to treatment and you say, why didn't that work? Well, I guess that didn't stick. You know, it's like we're, we're throwing spaghetti and we're waiting to see how long it sticks. I mean, there is no cure for this. Addiction is a lifelong commitment to recovery. It goes into remission so long as somebody stays in remission and they control that remission by doing the work, by working on their recovery. I did another video called Why Treatment Doesn't Work. I mean, I listen, I love you this much that I have made all these hundreds of videos for you to be able to start to learn. But I can tell you, what'll cut through the chase here is if I have you in my presence and like starting with that 90 minute, uh, if it's still available, if it's still up at the time I'm filming this, it is available. Um, and if not, you can send me an email and ask me about that and say, Oh my God, I would love to have 90 minutes with you to just tell you what's going on and, and, uh, you know, get your support and get your, your advice. And I, and I'd be happy to pour that into you one-on-one and you can tell me all the things, right? Because that's it's important. You need a place to be able to go, to be able to be supported, a place to be able to talk about how this is impacting you and feeling like, yeah, well, that's true, but I can't see really how to do this in this situation. Or Heidi, can you really teach me how that would look? Or Heidi, I, I want to try to get them in treatment. Can you help me? Or Heidi, I want to get them to leave, or I want to file for divorce, or I don't know if I should stay or go. Those are the types of things I can help you figure out. Go over to HeidiRain.com and, and uh, purchase a session so that I can help you. Okay.
So this last thing is the cure, really understanding what the road of recovery looks like and stopping and stopping the idea that there's a magic panacea. That's addict, addicted thinking, by the way, is that there's a pill I can take. There's a, there's one thing I can do to cure all this. It's really a multi-pronged approach. Treatment is one thing. Then recovery becomes another thing. And with recovery, there's a whole treatment team around this person to help them. And you, by the way, should be the last person they go to for help in recovery. Why? Because you're not a treatment center. You're not a sober coach. You're not a halfway house. You're not a therapist. And by the way, even if you are, and I do have therapists and psychologists that I see inside my practice, I see coaches, I see therapists uh, that come to me. <laughs> that I'm, I mean, I have my own people that I go to. Sure, everybody should. I believe that. But I also have the therapists that work in addiction who come through my courses and programs because even as much as you know, as much as you've studied, as much as you understand, when it's your life, you have a scotoma. A scotoma is you can't see it. It's like everybody's like, you know, Tony Robbins talks about this all the time. A scotoma is where you're you're looking in the kitchen for the salt and you're like, where's the salt? Where's the salt? And you get all upset and you're looking in every cabinet and they're like, where's the hell is the salt? And then your partner comes in and goes, it's right here. And it's like literally right in front of you. That's what this addiction does to us is it makes us blind, even in our own brilliance. So I love you. I hope this has been helpful for you today. If it has, will you please like it out loud? It helps us help more people. We have a big mission here. We want to impact millions of lives with this ministry and with uh, education on addiction and to help people break free from codependency and to live authentic, beautiful, enriched, happy lives where the, they're getting the love they deserve. And we, we can't do that without your help. We really need your help to spread this message, to share it with people. And I know it can be a secretive community. You don't want a lot of people to know what's going on, but I guarantee you, the more you're willing to kind of open up, at least take the first step and get the support, then it starts the ball rolling. Um, things that live in the dark, um, they, they, they're they the things that end up killing us at the end of the day. Okay. So if we can work step-by-step step to bring more light to this issue, to share this video with people you think it might be helpful, to book this session and support us here in our mission, um, to get the strategy you need to help your children, uh, to buy the books that we have or, or the books I've written about how addiction impacts the family. Any of those things help us continue to further this message. And of course, if you'd like to donate or if you'd like to scholarship somebody through one of our courses, we have that option as well. And you can find out more about that by emailing me over at HeidiRain.com. Okay, I love you. Take excellent care of yourself and I'll see you really soon in another session such as this or private session with just me and you. I'll talk to you soon. Bye-bye.